And good morning to you. Welcome to another edition of the Sabbath School Study Hour. It is uh, such a nice day to be able to get together, to be able to study God's Word. I trust that you are having a good day so far, and I know that if you invest the next hour with us and with this program, that you will be even more blessed as we continue to study the great promise that God has given to us in his overall covenant that he has given throughout history since the fall into sin, and then as we also look at the different covenants that God has uh, presented that through, and to today looking at lesson number six, which is uh, Abraham's seed. And uh, so as many of us know, Abraham is the great patriarch of the faith. He goes back the furthest as far as one of God's most prominent people since the flood. And uh, we are continuing to go through a very, very a powerful quarterly study entitled The Promise, God's Everlasting Covenant. If you don't have a copy of the uh, Sabbath School Quarterly, make sure that you get a copy if your local Seventh-day Adventist church is open and uh, go and visit that local Seventh-day Adventist church. I know that many of them have them. They'll be happy to give you a free copy for you to be able to use. And uh, if you uh, also go and uh, Google that online, I know that more than once I've also found different resources online that offer that in a digital format for free. So please take advantage of that as we look at it here again today. Uh, before we look into our uh, worship in song, I also want to uh, offer you a free gift offer that we always have available in different forms as we get together to study during the Sabbath School Study Hour. Today is uh, one of the most powerful classics of uh, the past. It's called Alone in the Crowd by Pastor Joe Cruz. And uh, if you'd like to receive a free copy of this and then you are in the United States, or in this case, actually, in uh, North America, you can go ahead and dial 866 788 3966. That's 1 866 788 3966 or 1866 study more. Now, when you go and dial in for that, uh, the easiest way to be able to get this free offer is to ask the uh, servant or agent that will be answering there, number 714. That's offer number 714. Now, I know that a lot of us are looking for digital. Uh, copies of our different literature today, and uh, we like to read from our phone or tablets or computers and such. In that case, go ahead and text the word SH004, and you want to text that to the number 40544. Now, that is only available in the United States right now. Uh, if, you go in, if you again go to the Amazing Effects website and search around a little bit, you can also find that free digital copy available um, if you're in different countries of the world. Well, with that being said, before we open with prayer and invite our teacher out here today, we want to invite our musicians out as we worship the Lord in song. sing when I pause to remember a heartache here is but a stepping stone along a trail that's winding always upward this troubled world is not my final home but until then my heart will go on singing until then with joy i'll carry on until the day my eyes behold the city until the day God calls me home. The themes of earth will dim and lose their value if we recall they're borrowed for just a while and themes of earth 
that cause the heart to tremble remember there will only bring a smile but until then my heart will go on singing until then with joy I'll carry on until the day my eyes behold the city until the day God calls me home but until then my heart will go on singing until then with joy I'll carry on until the day my eyes behold city until the day God calls me home I want to invite you to close your eyes as we bow our heads and pray. Father in heaven, this morning we are thankful to be able to come together. We are thankful for your Bible, that you give us the word of truth, that you have not left us to our own, but you desire for us to be able to understand the great love and promises that you have towards us. And God, today as we come together to open your Bible and look at this great promise that you gave to Abraham that even extends to us, I want to pray, God, that your Holy Spirit will guide us and lead us and help us to understand. Please bless our teacher today as Pastor Rod is going to be presenting your word. You know the time that he spent with you, both on his knees and in your word. And Father, we want to pray that all of that hard work and his service today will help us to better understand your word. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Have you been blessed by the quarterly that we've been in, the promises, the, the covenant of God, the sa- plan of salvation? I have truly been blessed. And today we have an amazing topic to talk about, Abraham's seed. It is a powerful lesson and uh, I don't know about, about you, I don't know if your mind works the way mine does, but when I hear that statement, Abraham's seed, it immediately comes to my mind, who is that, right? Who is Abraham's seed? Well, we want to answer that question today. But before we can answer that question, we've got to ask another question, and that is, who is Israel. Who is Israel? Well, you remember that there was a man in the book of Genesis in the Old Testament by the name of Jacob, and Jacob is the son of Isaac, and Isaac is the son of Abraham, and Abraham is the father of the Jews. And the name Jacob means deceiver. I love that the names of the people in the land of Israel, that their names have meaning. And Jacob means deceiver. And Jacob truly lived up to his name, didn't he? He deceived his brother out of his birthright. And then he deceived or tricked his father into giving him the blessing. Now, Jacob and Esau were brothers. They were twins. But Esau was the firstborn, and so he was entitled to the family blessing. He was to receive the, the, uh, the rights of the firstborn, but Jacob tricked him out of that, deceived him out of that, and then he deceived his father, Abraham. And you see in the picture there on the screen that, that uh, Jacob had something funny on his hand. He 
took some goat skin and he put it on his hand because his, fa- his brother was very hairy. And at this point, Isaac was uh, losing his eyesight. He couldn't see very well. And so the idea was when his father would feel that, he would think that it was Esau and give him the blessing. And guess what? The trickery worked. In fact, uh, in Genesis chapter 27, verse 36, Esau was so mad, he said, Is he not rightly called Jacob? Because Jacob means deceiver. Well, the deception costs Jacob a lot because Jacob had to flee from his home because his brother Esau was very upset with him. He was considering killing him. And so Jacob had to run away and he never got to see his mother alive again. But Jacob ran away and he went to his uncle Laban who was a bit of a deceiver himself, wasn't he? Jacob fell in love with Laban's daughter and he wanted to marry her. But on the wedding day, his father-in-law tricked him, deceived him, and he married the oldest daughter, Leah. And so now he says, well, I'll give you, Rachel, but you've got to give me more years of service. And then the two wives ended up giving him a couple of their handmaids, and so there was some polygamy going on here. And Jacob had many children from them. They became a blended family. But eventually the time came when Jacob was impressed by God to return to the land of his birth and to be reunited with his brother Esau. And as they are on the journey and going, they get to the point where the next day Jacob is going to meet his brother and he is not certain whether or not his brother has truly forgiven him. And so he's afraid. He sends the family ahead and he is alone by himself one night and he begins wrestling with a man. And uh, he thought that this man was one of uh, maybe his brother's men and he was fighting for his life. And he began to fight all through the night wrestling with this man. The Bible says the angel of the Lord. And it came about morning just when the sun was about to uh, break and the, the man touched him on his hip and his hip was immediately put out of place and Jacob realized that he was not wrestling with an ordinary man but he was wrestling with the Lord. And so now he really began to wrestle, not to get away this time, but this time he was holding on because if this was the Lord, he needed assurance. He needed a blessing. And so he held on and he said to the Lord, I will not let you go until or unless you bless me. And in fact, the Lord did bless him, and Jacob received a new name, and that new name was Israel, which means overcomer or someone who has been victorious. And so Israel is the spiritual name that was given to the father of the nation of Israel, And Jacob had 12 sons, and they became the sons of Israel, and eventually they became the fathers of the 12 tribes of Israel that we know as the nation of Israel over there in the Middle East in Palestine. And the Bible says in Genesis 32, 28, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. Now, the New Testament makes a distinction between Israel and his children. I want, I want to show you that. Turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, the Apostle Paul is speaking to the church in Rome. He's speaking to us. And notice what he says starting in verse 1. Paul says, I tell you the truth in Christ, I am not lying, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit, that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not 
all what? They are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called, that is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not what? These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed." So here we see the Apostle Paul telling us that they are not all Israel who are of Israel. There's the Israel of the flesh, and then he also speaks of the children of promise. And he refers to the the children who come by Isaac as the children of the promise. And I want you to notice something that Jesus says in John chapter 8, verse 39. He says, if, and he's talking to the Pharisees that had been questioning him, he says, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. In other words, what he is saying to them is you must not be Abraham's children. Because if you were Abraham's children, then you would be doing the things or you would be doing the works of Abraham. In another place, in John chapter 1, verse 47, when Jesus was uh, looking, he saw Nathanael coming, and he said, Behold, an Israelite indeed. Or in other words, an Israelite in truth, or a true Israelite. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 18, Paul says, observe Israel after the flesh. And I ask you the question, why did Paul have to qualify his statement? Why did he have to say, observe Israel after the flesh? Well, I'll tell you why. Because there are two Israels. Notice in Galatians chapter 6, verse 14 through 16, It says, but God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision, that's the Jews, nor uncircumcision, that's the Gentiles, avails anything but a new creation. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon who? Upon the Israel of God, which is a different group of people than the Israel of the flesh. You have the Israel of the flesh, those who are uh, of the genealogy, those who are of the heredity of Abraham, and then you have the Israel of God, who are the descendants of Abraham's faith. In other words, both Jew and Gentile who have faith in Jesus Christ, they are the Israel of God. And he makes that point in Romans chapter 9, which we just read, which says, for they are not all Israel. That is, they are not all the Israel of God who are of the nation, the lineage, the flesh of Israel. That's pretty revealing, isn't it? It says not everyone who is a descendant of Abraham is actually a true Israelite. The Bible reveals that there are two Israels. Did you catch that? Two Israels. I want you to notice in Romans 2 verse 28 that it says, He is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. In other words, you are not necessarily an Israelite if you have the genes of Abraham or if you are of the, uh, of the heredity. There is the Israel in the flesh, that is those Uh, who are of the genealogy of Abraham, those over there in the Middle East in the land of Palestine. And then Romans 2.28 continues. He says, but he is a Jew who is one what? Inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart. You see, all through the New Testament, Paul reveals that there are two 
Israels. There is the Israel of the flesh over there who, who believed that they received the promises of God simply because they were of the heredity of Abraham. And then there is Israel of the spirit or spiritual Israel, those who believed like Abraham believed, those who have the faith of Abraham, not necessarily the genes of Abraham. And so I have a question for you. To which of the two Israels are the promises of God made? To the Israel in the flesh or spiritual Israel? Well, in order to answer that question, we need to understand a prophecy that is so amazing and so clearly shows that Jesus is the Messiah that uh, the Jewish rabbis put a curse on anyone who would attempt to determine its meaning. Because remember, the Jews did not consider Jesus to be the Messiah. But this so perfectly addresses the fact that he is that they wrote this in Talmudic law. May the bones of the hands and the bones of the fingers decay and decompose of him who turns the pages of the book of Daniel to find out the time of Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 to 27. And may his memory rot from off of the face of the earth forever. That's a pretty strong curse, isn't it? They don't want anyone looking into Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 to 27. And you'll, you'll remember as, you know, I don't believe in coincidences, do you? I, I think it's perfect timing on, beha- on behalf of God that we would have this study of Abraham's seed today as we have been going through this seven deadly myths Uh, Bible study with Scott Ritzma. And you'll remember on the first night that he talked about this prophecy. It's called the 70-week prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. And then he talked about it again last night. Now, I don't want to go through the whole thing, but I do want to do a little bit of a review of this. They were given the command to restore and build Jerusalem. That was to be the indication of the beginning of the 70-week prophecy, which was cut off from the larger 2300-day prophecy. And there were actually three decrees that went out. You'll remember that Israel was taken captive to Babylon, but then Babylon was uh, overtaken by the Medes and the Persians, and it was the first king of the Medes and Persians, Cyrus, who made the first decree to let them to go back to Israel and to start building the walls and rebuild the temple. And then the second decree was essentially the same thing reiterated by King Darius, and it wasn't until Artaxerxes made the decree that they could both build and restore. And that was when he allowed them to go back and set up magistrates and, and, uh, and judges to have their own civil government. So now this third decree is the one that actually fulfills the prophecy where they could restore to their own government, they could be once again a sovereign nation. And you go back and and you look at Ezra chapter 7 and you'll see that decree and you look at history and you'll see that that was in 457 BC that that command was given. And it was a 70-week prophecy. So if you take 70 weeks times seven days in a week, that's 490 days. But as Scott was talking about over the first day and then last night in this new Bible series, Seven Deadly Myths, you saw that the days actually in Bible prophecy equal a year. And he took us into Numbers and Ezekiel. And so that's 490 years. And the command was that there would be seven weeks and 62 weeks. And then what would happen? Messiah the Prince would show up, right? So 69 weeks into the 70-week prophecy, Jesus would show up. And it's very interesting that Jesus, uh, at his baptism, he became anointed with the Holy Spirit, right? That's what Messiah means, the anointed one. 
And the Bible tells us <coughs> that it was in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. And you go back in history and look at that, and you'll see that that was 27 A.D. Friends, Jesus was anointed right on time. But that, but that leaves one more week into the prophecy, and that, that prophecy told us in Daniel chapter 9 that in the middle of that week, the Messiah would be cut off. Off, but not for himself. And we know that three and a half week, three and a half years into that last seven years, that Jesus died on the cross, that he confirmed a covenant with many, and he put an end to sacrifices and oblations. And so we see that that perfectly fits that Jesus is, in fact, the Messiah. But in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, it says, Know and understand the vision, right? That there were 70 weeks determined for you and your people. Now, Daniel was a Jew, and so this, this 70 week prophecy is a probationary period for the children of Israel. And what were they to do in that probationary period? They were to finish the transgression, they were to make an end of sin, they were to make reconciliation for iniquity, they were to seal up the vision and prophecy, and they were to anoint the most holy place. Now I have a question for you. Did they in fact fulfill the conditions of the 70-week prophecy? Did they finish the transgression? Did they make an end of sin? Well... Not as a nation they didn't, right? But the 70 weeks were fulfilled in who? In Jesus Christ, that's right. He finished the transgression. He put an end to sin. He made reconciliation for iniquity. He sealed up the vision and prophecy. And when he returned to heaven, he anointed the most holy place. The 70-week prophecy was fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ who became the new Israel, the overcomer on our behalf. He is the spiritual father of Israel. He is the true Israel and the seed of Abraham. And that's why the Bible says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 29, and if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed. So I ask you the question again, to which of the Israels are the prophecies of the Bible pertaining to? And to which Israel are the promises made? Literal Israel or spiritual Israel? Well, we have already seen, haven't we, that Jesus is the only one who fulfilled the conditions. Now, let's look for a moment with our spiritual glasses on at the nation of Israel. When the children of Israel were slaves in Egypt, God raised up a man by the name of Moses, and you'll remember that Moses killed one of the Egyptians, and then he fled into the wilderness, and he was gone for 40 years. But then you remember in Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, that God said to Moses, you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So here we see that Israel is my son, he is my firstborn. In Psalm chapter 80 verse 8, it says, thou hast brought a what? A vine out of Egypt, thou hast cast out the heathen and planted it. So here we see that Israel is a vine out of Egypt. In Isaiah chapter 49, verse 3, it says, And he said to me, You are my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. So here we see that Israel is called my servant. In Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1, it says, Behold my servant, whom I am uphold, my elect one, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. This is talking about Israel. In Isaiah chapter 41, verse 8, it says, But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. Again, we see here that Israel is called my servant, and then we see that 
Israel is also called the seed of Abraham. In Hosea chapter 11, it describes how Israel was to be brought out by, uh, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm by God uh, via the ten plagues and through the leadership of Moses. And it says in verse 1, when Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. Now, do you remember after being called out of Egypt as the nation of Israel came out, what happened? They went to the Red Sea, and then Pharaoh's army was coming after them. They were trapped. They had nowhere to go, and so God parted the Red Sea, and they walked through, and it tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1, Paul says, all of our fathers were baptized into Moses and into the cloud and in the sea. And so they were all baptized in the sea. And then you remember when they came through the Red Sea, they, they went to the promised land, but because of a lack of faith, because of unbelief, they were not allowed to go into the promised land and they had to wander in the wilderness for how long? For 40 years, that's right. So I ask you the question again, who is Israel? Well, Israel is my son, my firstborn, a vine out of Egypt, my servant, the seed of Abraham. They were baptized and then they spent 40 years in the wilderness. Now let's look at a few more verses. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 13, it says this, The angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt. Now, who is this talking about? Talking about Joseph, right? You'll remember that when Jesus, or I'm Susie, it's talking about Jesus, but you'll remember that when Jesus was born, that Herod was the king, and he, you know, he knew about this messianic prophecy, some king who was going to come and rule all of Egypt. He was jealous of that. He wanted to continue his rule, and so he sent his men, and they went to Bethlehem to kill all the baby boys uh, two years and, and under. And so Joseph and Mary and Jesus had to flee down into, into Egypt. Now, I find it very interesting, just on a side note, I find it very interesting that in the history of Israel that there was a man by the name of Joseph who was one of the sons of Abraham who was sold by his brothers into slavery into Egypt. And now you have, and he had dreams, right? That's kind of what got him in trouble with his brothers. He told them about his dreams. And now you have another Joseph who has a dream, and he's told to go down into Egypt. And Matthew chapter 2, verse 13 continues, though, and it says that it may be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, out of Egypt I have called my son now hold on a minute what's this saying here this is saying that in order for the prophecy to be fulfilled it wasn't going to happen to literal Israel but it was going to happen to who to Jesus. That's right. Jesus Christ had to be called out of Egypt. It says that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, out of Egypt I have called my son. And so Hosea 11 verse 1 was only fulfilled by Jesus. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 1, it speaks of Jesus. It says, he is the image of the invisible God, the what? The firstborn over all creation. John chapter 15 verse 1 says, Jesus said, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Matthew chapter 12 verse 16 to 18 says, he warned them not to make him known that it might be fulfilled which is spoken of by Isaiah the prophet saying, behold my servant. And do you remember the promise of God to Abraham? Genesis chapter 15, verse 5, he said, Look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. So shall your offspring be. 
But then Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. And I want you to notice that it goes on and it says, and he does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed who is Christ. Now keep following along with me. Mark chapter 1, verse 9, it says, it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan River. Matthew chapter 4 verse 1 and 2 then says, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where he was tempted for how long? For 40 days, right? So I ask you the question again, who is Israel? Well, Jesus is my son. Jesus is my firstborn, a vine out of Egypt, my servant, the seed of Abraham. He was baptized, after which time he spent 40 days in the wilderness. You see, friends, Jesus is the fulfillment of true Israel. And that's why the Bible says that those who are Christ's are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise because Jesus fulfilled that which was spoken of. You see, Jesus is the true Israel and Jesus is the seed of Abraham. And if you believe in Jesus, if you have asked him to come Come into your heart, be your Lord and Savior, forgive you of your sins. He has written his law in your mind and in your heart. You have the Spirit of God in you. You become co-heirs with Christ. You become spiritual Israel. You become the seed of Abraham through him. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, for all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. In Christ, all of the promises of God are yes. And Paul says it's not that the Word of God has taken no effect. It's that literal Israel has been replaced by spiritual Israel, and He is our new spiritual Father, Christ Jesus, our righteousness. Now, let's look at some of the texts dealing with Israel as God's favored nation. Because as Scott was talking about last night, all eyes are on Israel today, aren't they? They're looking to physical Israel. They're looking to the temple being rebuilt. But what does the Bible have to say about that? Notice in Galatians chapter 3, verse 7. It says, Know ye therefore that they which are of the genes of Abraham, is that what it says? No, they are the faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Galatians 3.28, the next verse says, Therefore, there is neither Jew nor Greek, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. It goes on to say, and if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The promise is for those who are Christ. There's no special reuniting of the Jews that's required to fulfill the promise to Israel because the promises are fulfilled in those who believe in Jesus Christ. We are not looking forward to an earthly Canaan. Yes, Israel was given the promised land. They are the type, but Christ is the anti-type. They were pointing forward to him. So we're not looking for an earthly Canaan. We are looking to a heavenly Canaan. Galatians chapter 4, verse 28 says, Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. Friends, God has promised us some pretty amazing things, hasn't he? He has promised us that that he can give us, not only cleanse us, wash us as white as snow from our sins, but he can give us the Holy Spirit. He can give us the power to overcome and to live without sin. And, And God has also promised, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may also be. Philippians chapter 3, verse 3 says, We are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no what? No confidence in the flesh. The flesh avails nothing, right? 
Well, I want to end today by making this appeal to you. On the first coming of Jesus, the world was looking for a conquering king, and so they missed the suffering servant. And I asked you the question, we are on the brink of the second coming of Jesus, and as the world is looking to physical Israel, are they going to miss spiritual Israel? You see, Israel received the name Israel because he wrestled with God and received a name change. Have you received your name change? In our study this week, we saw that these people are Christians, whether Jew or Gentile, but it called them in our study the remnant, right? Do you remember Elijah had this mountaintop experience on Mount Carmel, called down fire from God, killed the prophets of Baal and Asherah, but then Jezebel threatened to kill him, and he fled. He was afraid, and at some point, he said to God, they've killed all the other believers. He says, I'm the only one left. And you remember what God said? He said, I have 7,000 that have not bowed the knee to Baal, right? God has always had a remnant, when Cain killed Abel, there was still a remnant because then Seth was born. But then things became corrupted as the children of God, the true Israel, began to mingle with physical Israel, if you will, and it pulled them away from God. And in the days of Noah, there was a great flood. But God had a remnant, eight people that survived. And God has always had a remnant, even up to this day. And even though, as Scott has been showing us through this series, that there is apostasy in the church of church of God, God still has a remnant, amen? God still has people who are faithful to him today, and all of the promises are to them. I want you to notice, if you have your quarterly with me, look at Wednesday of this week as we studied this topic of Abraham's seed. Notice the first paragraph. It says, although God's plan for ancient Israel was spoiled by disobedience, it was never completely frustrated. Among the weeds, a few flowers still grew. Many of the Old Testament prophets speak of this faithful remnant whom God would gather unto himself as a lovely bouquet. The plan of God has not been frustrated by the attempts of the devil, amen? God still has a remnant, and he is still working his plan, and he's going to bring that to a place where his people are just like him, amen? Look at the third paragraph. Thus, no matter how bad the situation became, God always had some faithful people who, despite apostasy within the ranks uh, of God's chosen people, kept their own calling and election sure. In short, whatever the failings of the nation as a whole, there were still those who tried to keep as best they could their end of the covenant. And though perhaps they suffered with their nation as a whole, such as when exiled from the land, the final and ultimate covenant promise will be theirs, that of eternal life. And so even though there is this apostasy in the church going on, God has a faithful people. And God, and what does it say about those people in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17? They keep the commandments of God... And the faith of Jesus or the testimony of Jesus, right? One's 14, 12, one's 12, 17. They have the faith of Jesus. I don't know about you, friends, but my faith always fails. My faith is weak. My faith stumbles, right? But the faith of Jesus is powerful. The faith of Jesus, uh, uh, he overcame on our behalf, right? He is the overcomer. He is Israel. He is the seed of Abraham. And we are co-heirs along with him. Notice on Thursday's lesson, first paragraph. 
Whatever the mistakes and failings of ancient Israel, the Lord was not finished with the plan of creating a faithful people to serve Him. In fact, the Old Testament looked forward to a time when the Lord would create a spiritual Israel, a faithful body of believers, Jews and Gentiles, who would carry on the work of preaching the gospel to the world. And then it goes on to say, welcome to the early church, right? Probation had closed for Israel. They did not do what they were called to do in that probation, but Jesus did. Remember when Jesus first went into the temple, when he began his ministry, he said, this is my father's house, but you have made it a den of thieves. And then the last time he went in, at the end of his ministry, he said, behold, your house is left to you what? Desolate, right? God had left the sanctuary. God was no longer with him. They were no longer the chosen people of God. And I liked how last night that Scott was talking about, you know, some people seem to think that God has one plan for Israel and another plan for the Gentiles. But we see that God is the only one who can bring both Jew and Gentile together and create a a people who truly will keep his commandments, who love him enough to do all that he has asked. And so here we see the spiritual Israel. And friends, we want to be a part of that group, don't we? We want to be a part of spiritual Israel. We want to be those who don't necessarily have the genes of Abraham, but have the faith of Abraham. And this is the Israel that God has made all of the promises to. And I ask you the question, have you received a name change? Are you a new person? Paul said, or excuse me, uh, Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again, right? You must have the Spirit of God in you, not only to cleanse you from the inside out, but to empower you to keep the commandments of God. And that's why Paul says that at the end of time, there is going to be a group of people who call themselves Christians who have a form of godliness but deny its power. Only those who are the remnant, only those who truly have surrendered their life to Jesus Christ, it's only those who the promises are given to. I'm looking forward to eternal life. How about you? Amen. You know, there's so much that we could talk about in this lesson, and I I just really appreciate it. Let me read one more. Look at the last paragraph on Thursday's lesson. As a son of Abraham, Christ became in a special sense heir to the covenant promises. By baptism, we acquire kinship to Christ and through him acquire the right to participate in the promises made to Abraham. Thus, all that God promised Abraham is found in Christ and the promises become ours not because of national nationality, race, or gender, but through grace which God bestows upon those through faith. That's us, isn't it? He has given those promises to us. Well, friends, we are out of time, so let's close with a word of prayer. Oh, loving Father, we are so grateful and thankful that you loved this world so much. You loved us that you gave your only begotten Son, that he came to this earth, took on the form of a man, and he went to the cross and died for us. He overcame the deceptions of the devil to save us. Lord, you have great plans for us and great plans for the nation of Israel. It's not that they can't be saved now. They can be grafted in just like we are. And so, Lord, our prayer is that you would open our eyes to this truth. Help us to fall in love with the truth. And Lord, help us to surrender our heart to you more and more each day. Lord, we want to be the children of promise. We want that heavenly Canaan. But more importantly, Lord, we want you. As you said to Abraham, I am your exceedingly great reward. Lord, we look forward to the time 
when we will be with you. We will no longer live by faith, but we will live by sight. And Lord, our prayer is that you will do that work in us that we cannot do in ourselves. And Lord, the things that we can do, we pray that you would send your angels to come and minister to us and that, Lord, they would help us to do those things that we can do because the things we can do, you won't do. But the things we can't, you come alongside and you do those things for us. You are our overcomer. You are Israel. You are the seed of Abraham. And, Lord, we want to be co-heirs with you. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Meet Derek. He has a lead foot, just like his father Henry. One day, Derek overslept when his alarm went off. Now he has to race to work to make it on time. Not that he needed an excuse for driving fast. As fate would have it, a police officer was sitting on the side of the road with his radar on and Derek got pulled over for speeding. Derek knew he deserved a ticket and begged the officer for mercy. After thinking about it, the officer decided not to give Derek a ticket, even though he broke the law. Now, do you think Derek would then peel out from the side of the road, throw gravel on the officer and then speed away? Not likely. Derek was under the condemnation of the law. He should have been punished. But the officer showed him mercy by not writing him a speeding ticket. The grace shown to Derek by the officer had a transforming effect on him. He drove away very willing and motivated to obey the speed limit, even after the police car was out of sight. That's what the Bible means when it says, we are no longer under the law, but under grace. Like Derek, we have all broken laws. He violated the civil law, and everyone on earth has violated God's moral law. It's no surprise that God's law demands punishment. However, his law only condemns. It cannot save. We are saved through faith in Christ alone. Jesus earned the right to set aside the demands of the law by taking the punishment for our sins upon himself at Calvary's cross. That way, the justice of the law could be maintained and we lawbreakers could be saved. The fact that the creator of the universe had to come to our earth to pay the penalty for his broken law proves the law is unchanging and unchangeable. If God's law were changeable, then God could have just changed it before Jesus came or even done away with it completely. That way, he could have spared his son the terrible experience of taking our punishment on the cross. Paul said in Hebrews 5, Once Jesus was made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Hebrews 5, 9. As Christ is our example in all things, his obedience to the requirement of the law shows us the perfect pattern for holiness. The grace and mercy the officer showed Derek did not remove the law against speeding, nor does the grace God gives to the sinner remove the law against sinning. God's perfect law will be the standard for all creation forever. In Romans 3, Paul said, do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. How could the law be established through our faith in Christ's death and yet nailed to the cross at the same time? Any confusion about the law being done away with at the cross comes from confusion between two laws. The ceremonial laws were necessary until Jesus died on the cross. After Christ died, no one needed to sacrifice animals. The sacrifice that ended all sacrifices for sin was Jesus. The killing of animals, Paul said, had been contrary to us. It had not been easy to kill an innocent animal, knowing it must die because of sins the people committed. 
What was nailed to the cross then? It was the handwriting of ordinances, written by Moses, the ceremonial law dealing with sacrifices and feast days. That's what was nailed to the cross and taken out of the way, not the moral law written by God in stone. But let's consider for a moment the popular Christian view that the Ten Commandments were nailed to the cross. As a Christian, doesn't this give you cause for concern? I mean, are we not then promoting the idea that Jesus died to remove moral accountability to our Creator and each other? That idea sounds more like a secular agenda than one Christian should advocate. Apostle Paul wrote that Christians are no longer under the law, but under grace. Does that mean then that we don't need to obey the law of God? Let's think about that. Which of the big ten are Christians willing to say were rarely done away with at the cross? Certainly not taking God's name in vain, worshipping idols, dishonouring our parents, lying, cheating, stealing, killing, having adulterous affairs or coveting. No, there is only one commandment many are willing to admit was nailed to the cross. Ironically, that commandment is the only one that begins with the word remember. James wrote, if you break one of the commandments, you have broken them all. The Bible says, by the law we have the knowledge of sin. The law is a teacher that leads us to seek pardon and forgiveness for our sins. It shows us where we are lacking in genuine love for God and our fellow man. The only definition of sin found in God's word is, sin is the breaking of the law. Going back to Derek, without posted speed limits, he couldn't be held accountable for speeding. Without God's laws, we can't be held accountable for sin either. No law, no sin, no need of grace. The logical conclusion of the popular view that the moral law was nailed to the cross must be this. Jesus died for us because we broke the law, but now we don't have to keep the law. But is that what the Bible teaches? No, not at all. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He taught that willing obedience to the commandments is how we demonstrate our love for him and for others. In 1 John 2, the Apostle John urged the believers to sin not. They knew the moral law was still in effect. David said in Psalms 119, 160, All your words are true. All your righteous laws are eternal. However, God knows we cannot obey the law without his divine power and grace. In mercy, then, God empowers the repentant sinner to do that which he cannot do of himself, that is, to keep God's law in his own strength. As we contemplate Jesus' great sacrifice in taking our punishment upon himself, our hearts are one in loyalty to him. The fact that God's moral law was not nailed to the cross is really good news when you think about it. Just think, if the whole world kept God's commandments, there wouldn't be a murderer, thief, adulterer, rapist, criminal or lawbreaker in the world. Now is the time to allow Christ to write his law on our hearts and minds. Those who willfully disregard his laws now would find no joy in the earth made new, where sin and sinners will not exist. Something to think about. Have you ever skipped a meal? Not a bad idea if you need to watch your waistline, but there's a heavenly food you should never skip, God's Word. Yet, how can you dive in daily when you're so busy? 
Amazing Facts has you covered, and it's as easy as signing up for our daily devotional and verse of the day, both sent directly to your inbox, ready to bless, inspire, and inform you. To start receiving the Amazing Facts daily devotional and verse of the day, visit AmazingFacts.org and click on Bible Study in the main menu. You'll be glad you did. Happy Sabbath! It is so good to see you all. It's so good to be here. The Sabbath is a beautiful day of rest, of celebration. It's basically the day where we celebrate our relationship with God, and so it's so good to be here with you. I'd like to welcome also our online visitors. Thank you for being with us and sharing this moment with us. I hope that wherever you are right now, at home um, or anywhere else, that you are blessed by uh, our worship. I do have a few short announcements for you this morning. First of all, we have something really, really cool that's starting today at 1.30, which is a baptismal class. And so this is more... Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a class where, that prepares people that want to be baptized. We'll be going through the fundamental beliefs, the biblical doctrines, and Pastor Sean will be leading out on that. That will be at 1.30 this afternoon, and it will be in the church chapel. So you could just head over there um, at 1.30. Second awesome thing that I'd like to let you know about is um, Gospel on the Go. Now, this has been going on for the past few weeks. And today, again, Pastor uh, John and Pastor Carlos will be there, and they will be, um, they will be going over this really interesting and important subject when it comes to evangelism, which is um, how to start and build a conversation with other people. Sometimes we're just scared of just starting the conversation. So if you do want to learn more about that and even practice it, come, bring comfortable clothes because uh, we intend to go out and then practice what was learned. Um, there's a more... Uh, uh, bureaucratic uh, uh, announcement here, which is more of the board and elders meeting. We will be having that on Monday. The elders meeting starts at 6 p.m. and the board meeting at 7 p.m. in the Amazing Facts boardroom. So if you're a board member or if you're an elder, please be attuned to that. Also, the women's ministry will be having a great day tomorrow at 4 p.m. Um, here in the fellowship hall. There's more information about that here in the bulletin. So uh, if, you, if you're in the women's ministry group or if you want to be, uh, so guys, not you, okay? Just to make sure. Uh, the women ministry group, you are more than welcome to be here tomorrow at four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, we do have a church dedication coming up. Um, this is different from the inauguration, all right? This isn't the grand opening. This is more of an in-house uh, member uh, worship service where we will praise God and we will dedicate everything that is going to be happening here in our building and thanking God for providing for us this beautiful place to, to worship. So there is a difference. This is not the grand opening yet. That will happen later on. But on May 15, we will be having the, the church de dedication. And finally, um, I do want to let you know about something that's very dear to me, which is the Undaunted Courage uh, weekend that the youth, the Granite Bay youth will be having. It'll take place from the 19th of May through the 22nd. Um, all the youth, all the young people, be that, you know, in age or in spirit, you are all invited. It will be the whole weekend and and the three major topics will be creation and evolution, the authority of scripture, and how to share your faith. So uh, you can please register by visiting the Amazing Facts website. There's more information there for you. There are flyers outside that you could take and you could give to people that you're interested in inviting. So please be aware of that. We're very excited about that. There are a few more um, announcements in the bulletin. So please, if you do want to be in the loop as to what's going on at Granite Bay, please just read your bulletin and I'm sure that you'll be in the know. God bless you and uh, have a great worship service this morning. Please stand for our call to worship number 294, We Have This Hope. We have this hope that burns within our hearts, hope in the coming of the Lord. We have this faith that Christ alone imparts faith in the promise of his word. We believe the time is here when the nations far and near shall awake 
and shout and sing hallelujah christ is king we have this hope that burns within our hearts hope in the coming of the with me for prayer. Jesus, we have such deep and aspiring hope to be with you, and we want to see that day come soon through our gospel work, through the, the work that you've assigned to us to grow up to the stature and the fullness of Christ as a people. That is our desire to receive the baptism of your Holy Spirit this morning. So please be with us as we worship, as we study, and as we hear your word to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church family. Good to see each of you here today. I want to welcome those who we know are joining us live on AFTV to the Granite Bay Hilltop Church. This has been a special week where we have been learning about the seven deadly myths in Christianity. And this morning we're going to have the final presentation in that series, and it's just been a delight and a joy to have Scott Ritzman and his family here with us. Have you been blessed? Yes. Amen. Well, you'll get a chance today to prove that you've been blessed. I heard that um, there were two men that got marooned on a deserted island, and one of the men was so worried, he was walking up and down the beach, wringing his hands, scanning the shoreline, wondering would they ever be rescued. But his friend was just laying under a coconut tree and relaxing. And he went over to his friend. He said, I don't understand. Aren't you worried that we're never going to be rescued? He said, no, you don't understand. He said, back home, he said, I make about $10,000 a week. And he said, I faithfully pay tithe. He said, my pastor is going to mobilize the whole church to be looking for me. I have nothing to worry about. So if you should get marooned, would you need to worry that your church would not notice that you were gone? <laughs> Our offering today is going to be for the church family budget. And you folks have been so faithful. But we have a lot of other things going on in the church um, with uh, programs and things you can see. We're trying to stay busy in reaching souls and ministering to people. We do not collect the offering as we used to traditionally do. But you will see ushers at the doors smiling they smile more if you put something in the bag that they hold after the service and so we'd be very grateful let's pray together father in heaven we're so thankful for your many gifts to us for these beautiful days of spring you've given and especially jesus in the gospel and lord i pray that uh, we can remember the promise it is more blessed to give than receive and if we cast our bread on the waters it will return bless the offerings we give today lord we pray that you're well pleased with that. We thank you and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd also like to just say before our, our special music comes out, how much uh, we have appreciated uh, Jonathan and Janelle Casabasic and uh, Roan, who has been helping on the piano, and uh, just uh, Michelle, the work she's done in organizing the music. Hasn't it been a delight this week? Say amen, and we sure appreciate that. God bless. Thy kingdom come. 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever Good morning, church family. Please stand. Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. For those that are able, if we could kneel together in prayer as we come before the Lord. Our wonderful Father in heaven, Lord, we are so thankful for this Sabbath day, for this blessing and privilege we have to come together in your presence, Lord, in this place dedicated to your worship and your service. And Lord, you've made a promise that when we come together in your name, some in presence, some virtually, that you will be there. And Lord, we, we thank you for that promise. We believe you are here. Fill this place with your angels. Fill every mind with your spirit. Lord, we come before you and there's a lot of needs. We have needs personally. We pray you'll bless each person. Some need healing, Lord. We pray that you heal them and help them to experience recovery, that they might glorify you. Others might be struggling in their relationships and their families. And we pray you bring restoration, Lord, in those relationships. Um, some may have some financial issues. We know that you are the great provider bless them, help them find peace, that you will take care of them. And Lord, we, we also come before you because there are spiritual needs. We all need Jesus. He came to save us from our sins, Lord. I pray that people can experience that forgiveness and salvation and the power and transformation of a new heart today. We pray that you be with our church locally, worldwide, Please be with our country. There's so much turmoil and unrest, Lord, and we know the ultimate solution is going to be the coming of your son. But in the meantime, can we be, help us to be peacemakers? And now in a special way, we pray that you bless this service. Be with Brother Scott as he opens your word. Just give him the power of your spirit to make the truth um, come home clear to our hearts and that we can all be transformed by it. And all that we do, we ask, would glorify you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. If you would like to just join me with a hearty amen in thanking Brother Scott and his wife Cammie for coming out and being with us 
this week. Amen? Amen. And it's been such a blessing. And we're already talking about trying to get him back again to new other, another program. Thanks so much, Scott. Thank you. And thank you for having me. Amazing Facts, Granite Bay. What a week it has been. What a joy it has been. And this time I can, I can wish you happy Sabbath. I can say Feliz Sabado to our Spanish speakers. And I don't really speak Spanish, but I wanted to use that phrase because we learned earlier in the week that Sabbath is an actual day of the week. That kind of like was a, a thought unheard of to me when I first encountered that because we usually hear phrases like, oh, that's your Sabbath, this is my Sabbath. But when you look at it in Spanish, it kind of clarifies that. It wouldn't make any sense to say, this is your sab Sabado, this is my Sabado. Sabado is the day of the week, the seventh day of the week. We don't say, this is your Tuesday, this is my Tuesday. Like, what? What are you talking about? Well, anyway, happy Sabbath. Feliz Sabado. This is our final meeting together in this series, and I hope we will be in touch after this. You can drop me a line at beltoftruthministries at gmail.com. I'm happy to correspond with those who've, who've been challenged, who've been inspired, who have questions, who would like to give any, any feedback or be in touch. Beltoftruthministries at gmail.com. That reminds me there are some yellow notebooks that we did last Sabbath. If you didn't get that last time, get your email address on there. You can be on our periodic newsletter that we, that we put out um, through Belt of Truth Ministries. But uh, to be a guest at Amazing Facts is about, about the, the, the greatest thing to me because this ministry has meant so much to my wife and I in our walk with the Lord and coming to a knowledge of the truth. And uh, we've done seven deadly myths. Well, we've done six. This morning is the seventh. And I know I'm just like anxiously thinking, whoa, we had to leave so much out to, to condense it into 10 meetings and seven myths only. So there is a sequel coming. Remember the website? Go there. You can put your email address in and you'll get notified when the new series comes out. Um, Providenceandprophecy.com. Just put an email address in there and then you're going to be on the notification list so you'll be, uh, you'll be informed about when America's 11th Hour um, is released. That's a new series because we're in the 400th anniversary of the Pilgrims. That's pretty fun. So we're going to do the 400 years of Providence and Prophecy, America's 11th Hour. So we'll look at last day's prophecy and a bunch of other things that I don't have time for right now. And of course, DeadlyMythsBook.com to summarize all the texts and the things we've learned in this series. The free book there, put your email address in there and we'll email you that this summer when that comes out. So session number 10, you're thinking arise, kill and eat. What does that mean for a sermon title? Well, turn to Daniel 1. We're going to be there in a minute. But you heard the scripture reading, powerful text. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Everything we do in our lives is spiritual, isn't it? And you know, this was a very important theme for me in my spiritual development many years ago as a young person even, in, in, in understanding that it's not just going to church, it's not just the prayer time, it's not just those spiritual exercises, it's all of our life is to be lived to glorify God. And, and that, that's when I work, when I study, when I do uh, music or the creative arts, anything in the human experience can be done either to God's glory or it can dishonor God. Now, interestingly, Paul uses one specific example there, doesn't he? Sometimes we leave this one out. <laughs> Whether we eat or drink, whatever we do, do it all to the glory of God. Can you eat or drink to God's glory? Can you eat and drink in a way that dishonors God? That is this morning's topic. And some might have itching ears to hear what, you know, we kind of want to hear, the peace and safety message of, no, you don't have to talk about lifestyle. We don't want to talk about these kinds of things in the sermon. We buck against it. We say, oh, that's legalism, you know, to seek to obey God, to seek to conform our lives to his standards. It's legalism. Well, you know, my Bible says God wants to save me to the uttermost. He wants to transform my mind. He is able to keep me from falling into temptations of all kinds. And that he will not let me be tempted beyond what I can bear, but he will give me the strength to stand up under it. That Jesus was tempted in all points just as we are. That's a major teaching right there. Including on appetite, turn these stones into bread, the devil said to him. And he overcame in temptation at every point, just like we are. And then we can have the mind of Christ. Think about that. He wrought out a victorious character, conquered the devil. He lived that perfect life. And then we can be overcomers. You remember seven times it said in the first 
three chapters of Revelation that we will overcome. And not overcome in our own strength, overcome by the blood of the Lamb. It is only by Jesus' merits that we are forgiven, and it is only by Jesus' righteousness and merits that we overcome. Our title to heaven and our fitness for heaven are both found in the righteousness of Christ. So we can never forget that. Gospel power, because if it's in our own works and strength, then we're doomed, right? Well, I have some good news for you this morning, that Jesus' blood availeth for our complete salvation. Here's what it says in 3 John about health. It says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul prospers. Wow, so just as much as interest in our prosperity of soul. John is saying, I want you to have a healthy body. Now, why is, is physical health so important to God? Why isn't it more important to so much of Christianity? Maybe part of the reason is how we define a soul. Remember this idea of dualism from the Greeks, and you've got this floaty thing that can leave your body, and it's like the physical doesn't matter. The physical, we just ignore that. But you know what? God built Adam of dust. And Adam became a soul. Remember that in Genesis? It says he became a living being. The the Hebrew there, nephesh, for soul. Because he was made of something physical, God gave him the breath of life. And now this unity, not a dualism, but a unity of the physical and the breath of life. You are a soul. Body, mind, everything. The physiology of our human person is part and parcel of the totality of what we are as a soul. Never thought about that as a young person. This, was, this, this is something important in, in prophecy. You have the seal of God placed in the forehead, in a physical place there. Why does it say forehead? Well, you know about the brain, right? Quite literally, the frontal lobe of the brain is where we make the very decisions that are discussed in the seal doctrine in the Bible. Modern science has discovered that the frontal lobe is where we exercise sound judgment. It's where we have our spiritual reasoning. It's, it's our spirituality, our morality, our prayer and worship, discerning truth from error, having that discernment and decisions, most of all, for Christ, the will, decisions to follow him and to deny Satan's deadly myths. The frontal lobe is where we walk by faith with Jesus each and every day. And Paul brings this out in Romans 12. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your, notice this, your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do you see the connection between our bodies and our mind? If we want to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, it begins by offering our bodies as a living sacrifice to God. And there's serious warnings in the Bible about how we treat our bodies, what we put in our stomach, making the lusts of the flesh our God. Here's what Paul says in Philippians. These people's end is destruction because their God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame, and they set their mind on earthly things. 1 Corinthians 3.16 amplifies the point. It says, this body is a temple of the living God, and if you defile that, destruction comes our way in the end. There is a heaven to win and a hell to shun. Why such strong language about the temple of God and defiling the temple of God? Why such strong language about people whose God is their belly, their appetites are their ruling Savior and Lord, and it's serving a false God, isn't it? You think the devil has a deadly myth associated with this stuff? This is it. Myth number seven. God isn't all that concerned about what I put in my body or my mind. Media choices, dietary choices, oh, just a drink or two. It's not a salvation issue. Have you heard that phrase, not a salvation issue? That's like nails on a chalkboard to me when I hear that because if you're saying that to somebody and the Lord is striving with them on that particular point and they are rebelling against God on that particular point, whatever that point is, and they go, oh, cool, not a salvation issue, then I don't need to worry about it. Rebellion is a salvation issue. The Bible begs to differ about this thing of, oh, it's no big deal because if God brings truth to the heart and conviction to the heart and we say no to that, we are cutting ourselves off from God. You cannot serve two masters. Oh, but I love world media. I love watching this. It's not that big a deal. I just do that. And I play this and listen to that. I know I'm doing the media on the brain seminar. I apologize. I'm almost done. (laughs) It's a real serious salvation issue to say no to God. 
You cannot serve two masters. You will love the one and hate the other. You will be devoted to what the one and despise the other. And the Bible says, if any man loves the world, he doesn't love God the Father. He do, you don't love the Father if you love the world. That was 1 John 2, verse 5. So we're going to study Daniel 1 and talk about physical health. But all of that as the preface, as the introductory concept of God really does have a plan for our physical health. And obedience to God is part of our relationship with Jesus Christ. So Daniel, you're in Daniel 1. I've got to catch up with you. But do you know the context there of Daniel 1? He's a Jewish captive, he and his three friends. And they are taken to Babylon by the Babylonian conquerors who had come to Jerusalem, sacked the city, and taken away the captives. Daniel's one of the captives, and he's a promising young man. They think he could possibly, uh, you know, serve in the king's court here. So they bring him in. They give him the Babylonian training, the Babylonian education. The Babylonian diet is going to be appointed to Daniel and his friends. The Babylonian what? Diet. Oh boy, because this could be an impasse here. We're going to see a little, a little issue that Daniel faces with that. But he goes from slave to most trusted advisor in the court of the king pretty quickly here. He goes from slave, a captive, to the number one advisor to the king. How did he become the wisest man in the kingdom of Babylon? Well, the king appoints them three years of eating his rich food. And I mean rich food. This is the wealthiest kingdom in the history of the world. And the food is very rich. Lots of meat, lots of wine. And that's going to improve their skill as advisors. Uh, let's see what happens really here. In Daniel 1, verse 8, Daniel hears about this food and he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. So he's going to do something bold. Therefore, he requested of the prince that he might not defile himself. Can I not eat the king's appointed food? Go to verse 12. He says, prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days. Test us for ten days. Let's do a trial here. And let them give us pulse or vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee and the countenances of the children that eat the portion of the king's meat. So you look at our faces versus theirs and see the difference. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. Daniel's pretty confident in this. He's like, give us 10 days of just vegetables and water and you see the difference. You will be able to tell. Verse 14, so the, the, uh, the, the master here uh, consents to them in this matter and tests them for 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, here's the, here's the answer. Here's the findings of the first research study on eating a plant-based diet here. At the end of 10 days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh. Fatter, that's King James. These guys didn't get obese in 10 days. They were strong young men, stronger in flesh than all the children who did eat the portion of the king's meat. Thus Melzar, the, the master, took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. He's like, all right, you guys win. You, you, that way is better. Um, we're going to go ahead and let you keep living that way because it worked out well for you. But not just fairer and stronger and healthier physically, but our physical health reacts upon our spiritual health and our mental health, doesn't it? Because the brain is part of our body, so what we put in our body is going to affect the spiritual organ of our body, the, 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 the spiritual epicenter of our soul is the brain. So in verse 19, the king then communes with them. Oh, now, it's, now the test is really on. What does the king think of Daniel and his three friends? Well, he says, uh, the, the book of Daniel says in verse 19 that among them all, among all the advisors of the king was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they stood before the king. So they were elevated to this position right beside the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding, the king inquired of them, that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times wiser, ten times wiser, ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in his realm. Powerful story. It's amazing what God's plan can do for our physical, mental, and spiritual health. We can thrive as he planned. I want to bring this scripture back up. This is the one about offering your bodies as a living sacrifice. And that is a reasonable thing to do. It's rational. And it's to not be conformed to this world. We're not going to eat what the world eats. We're not going to eat the Babylonian diet. And then they were renewed of mind. The rest of the verse says this. This I didn't share with you yet. It says that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 
Daniel and his friends proved it. They tested it. And we can test the will of God. God says, test me in these things and see if I don't open the floodgates of blessing. He says, taste and see that the Lord is good. So this is an awesome thing that we can see right out of the gates that'll form the groundwork for our study this morning. But let's start with the king's wine, okay? The concept of wine and alcohol consumption. Did you know that Berkeley University Wellness Center points out that any blood alcohol level, even a BAC of 0.02%, the result of just one drink, impairs nearly every aspect of the brain's ability to process information. So with that in mind, what do you think the devil's going to do then? Well, let me see if I can get the vast majority of Christianity teaching that alcohol in moderation is acceptable for the Christian. Just one drink. It's not that big a deal. You're not like the world who are getting drunk. It's just a single drink. Well, a single drink is making the brain drunk, it says here. Even 0.02% is impairing nearly every aspect of the brain's ability to process information. Now, of course, God knew this way before these scientists did. It says in Proverbs 20, verse 1, that wine is a mocker. Strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. A brawler. It's an attack. It's an frontal assault on the frontal lobe of the brain. Just one drink affects the frontal lobe's ability to do these things we need to be doing so clearly in the last days. How was Daniel ten times better in understanding and wisdom? Well, he refused even just one drink, didn't he? Praise God for that. We could spend a whole session on the physiological effects of just one drink. It's toxic to the liver, reduces cardiac output, destroys vital enzymes, has to be detoxified by the body. As soon as alcohol hits the body, the body raises the alarm bell and says, this is a poisonous intrusion, detoxifies the alcohol. It makes unnecessary demands on the immune system, it generates free radicals, irritates the bladder. But most importantly for our purposes here, just one drink impairs nearly aspect, every aspect of the brain's ability. So the Bible says, do not look on the wine. Don't even look at it when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. At the last, it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. A serpent? Oh, that's an interesting term to use there. Who's the serpent of old? That great serpent called the devil and Satan. It's like this is a deception of Satan, the one who deceives the whole world. When you have a mind that is reduced from the things we put into it, you're more captive, led away, more, more um, danger for, in danger for deception. So don't even look at it, the Bible says. Don't even watch the commercials. How about that? Um, it's a trap. It's addictive. Don't even think about it. The New York Times reported that one in six Americans has a drinking problem. That is tragic. And what's even more sad is one in three American families say that their family has been affected by alcohol problems. So why in the world do we still have Christian churches recommending the drinking of alcohol with those kinds of catastrophic numbers and broken families? We've got to be warning people about the serpent, the brawler, as the Bible calls it. But we have our justifications lined up. I know, I used to use them. God saved me from that. But Paul told Timothy to use wine, right? And Jesus gave people wine at the wedding feast. So here's the verse about Paul and Timothy. He says, Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. And at first glance in our English, we go, Oh, wine, okay. Well, I, I'd like to drink some of that too. And then we get into drinking alcohol. But you have to look at the Greek word here. Is Paul saying, Hey, Timothy, look at the wine while it is red in the cup. It's not a brawler. It's not a mocker. It's not a serpent. Well, no, that would contradict the Bible. So Paul, the inspired epistle writer, is saying the word oinos here. And that's a Greek word that can apply to alcoholic wine and non-alcoholic grape juice. So it's, it, the word applies to both. So which one, in order for the Bible to harmonize, is Paul saying that Timothy should drink? He's saying drink the juice of the, of the grape. Drink some of that, it'll be good for your stomach. Now, how about when Jesus turned water into oinos? The same question remains. Was it alcoholic wine or was it non-alcoholic wine? Well, we already know from the texts we've looked at about how the Bible describes alcohol consumption. And scholars actually estimate that Jesus, by the size of the water pots that he made into wine, created 120 to 180 gallons of this drink. Now, if you're to tell me that Jesus brings the keg to the party, that he inspires Solomon to say these profound words about alcohol, it's like we're on a totally different wavelength here. He said, don't even look at it. And then he's going to provide it to people in such large quantities. That's a ton 
of alcohol per person. It was not alcoholic wine. In order for the Bible to be consistent, he made the tastiest, sweetest beverage, the fresh juice. And his disciples followed his example, by the way. Did you know that the disciples were mocked at one point for being new wine drinkers? You know the story of the baptism of the Holy Spirit when they received the tongues of fire and they were speaking in languages of all the people assembled and people were amazed and blown away. Many of them were impressed by the, by the Holy Spirit and by the power of God and the miraculous presenting of the gospel in other languages that they had not theretofore known. But others mocked. Remember that? Others mocked saying, oh, they, they're drunk on their new wine like you know those guys, those followers of Jesus. Those, those, they must be drunk on new wine. Why would they mention they're drunk on new wine other than a jab at their lifestyle? So apparently these young men were known as being strong in this area of their lives. Praise God. And they were ridiculed for it. We can stand strong too, even in the face of ridicule. The Bible says there is a blessing in the new wine. As the new wine is found in the cluster and one says, do not destroy it for a blessing is in it. God said the fresh juice is a blessing. That is a brawler. That is a blessing. The Bible is clear as always. But Wine is good for your heart. You've heard this, right? Gotta, gotta make sure you drink wine because it's good for your heart. Well, remember the alcoholic wine is a toxin to the body. And toxins increase cancer risk. So The Independent reported this as a headline. Red wine increases cancer risk. This is what the studies were showing that they were reporting on. Nine out of ten drinkers, though, are not aware of the cancer risk dangers of alcohol. So I guess the alcohol industry has been, done a pretty good PR job on going heart, help, help for, your, for your heart, reduces heart disease. Meanwhile, totally, total ignorance across the population on the cancer risk of alcohol because it's a one, even just one drink. It's a low dose poison done over time. That's a lot of doses. Alcohol itself, not healthy. Red wine and resveratrol, good for your heart, asks the Mayo Clinic. Here's what they say. The American Heart Association and National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute don't recommend that you start drinking alcohol just to prevent heart disease. Alcohol can be addictive and can cause or worsen other health problems. So why not just eat the grapes, right? Isn't that what you're thinking? Like alcohol is comprised of the nutrients of grapes plus the poison of the fermentation and the formation of alcohol. Why not just have the nutrients without the poison? Yeah, that's a good way to go. Okay, cigarette smoking. Boy, this is a big one. 20% of deaths in the United States are tobacco related. Each cigarette shortens our lives, the smoker's life, by 14 and a half minutes, one at a time. Slow motion suicide. They die 14 years younger on average. And thou shalt not kill is in the Ten Commandments. But even more importantly than that, when we do these things, it's disrupting our spiritual life. It's not just shortening our, our life. It's disrupting our connection with Jesus. But we can gain the victory. I know everybody knows smoking is wrong. I don't have to spend any time on that. But we do need the hope and the promise and the victory. I can do all things. All things through Christ who strengthens me. He will give you the power to quit whatever addiction, whatever habit is harming your physical, spiritual nature, taking time, wasting money, all of the things that addictions do. All addictions make us more depressed and less happy. He will give us the power. And you might say, that's impossible. But the Bible says he can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. My God shall supply all your needs. How many of our needs are supplied through his glorious riches in Christ Jesus? All of them. That means victory over alcohol. That means victory over every habit, just negative thoughts or anger or whatever habits we have in our life. God will give us the victory. Now, since we're talking about what we're putting in our bodies, what is the most consumed addictive drug in the world? Well, from the undergraduate research journal, caffeine Understanding the world's most popular psychoactive drug. Whether it's a steaming mug of morning joe or an afternoon pick-me-up soda, the world is addicted to caffeinated comforts. According to a study conducted by the New Scientist magazine, 90% of North American adults consume some form of caffeine on a daily basis, making this legal psychoactive substance the world's most widely used drug. And you might say, does God really care about my caffeine habit? It's not that big of a deal. Well, let me ask it this way. 
Does Satan want messages transmitting efficiently through the neurological circuitry of our brains? Well, of course, no, he, he, he wants to disrupt that. Did you know that? Caffeine is a neurotransmitter inhibitor. It disrupts and inhibits and prevents the messages passing through the circuitry of our brains. That's how it causes the sensations that it causes. So what does Satan do? He knows he's not going to get most Christians being alcoholics. Most Christians aren't going to smoke. But if we do a harmless drug, oh, and it's just messing with them maybe not as much, but it's still there, and nobody will see the significance of that. We'll have coffee everywhere, 90% of people drinking it every day, the caffeine every day, and quietly he is inhibiting neurotransmitter function in the brain. And by the way, you know it's not a good sign. When you want to have freedom in Christ, you want to live a victorious life, you don't want to be the slave of anything, anyone, any devil, when you find like you, you, you've missed your coffee and by the afternoon you're getting a headache or you know you go a day without it and you're getting the shakes and like I came off of this stuff and it was like, oh, and that was a good sign to me. Like you had a problem with that. And I don't want to have a problem with something. I want to be free from anything that might be chains upon me. That's a sign of a physical addiction. It's a real thing. Caffeine is the world's most widely used mind-altering drug. Johns Hopkins points out the world's most widely used mind-altering drug. Duke University researcher points out what we have found is that caffeine interacts with stress and intensifies it. By a show of hands, how many of you want more intense stress in your life? Not very many of us want more of that. Ah, the peace that transcends all understanding. That's what I want through Jesus. Caffeine isn't going to help me out with that. But the nutrients, you know, they find the nutrients. Yeah, there are nutrients in beans. And so coffee beans have some of those nutrients, but this is going to feel familiar. Can we just eat beans and get the nutrients just from the beans instead of the coffee bean, which is nutrients plus the addictive drug? So bean eating will be a good thing to do. Incorporate those legumes into your diet, and you'll be doing just great without the caffeine addiction. Now, this, is go this goes way back to the time of ancient Israel. It says in Exodus, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. You know, we call heart disease and type 2 diabetes lifestyle modern diseases. We figure that's, you know, the Western diet that causes that. And that's absolutely correct. But it's not modern. This was happening in ancient Egypt. The well-to-do, the ruling class in Egypt, when you look at the mummified and skeletal remains of the, of the Egyptians, particularly the wealthy Egyptians who had access to that more rich diet, you find unhealthy and diseased conditions, just as the Bible said right there. God says the Egyptians have been getting diseased. And if you follow my health plan, you won't have as much of a risk for those things. If you follow what I say, you'll be much healthier than them. So what are God's specific dietary guidelines? We're going to do a little bit of a story and a walk through in the scriptures, starting in Eden and seeing where we land also in the new earth. But go to Genesis 1 verse 29, and you're aware that in the Garden of Eden there was no death. Um, God made us in his image. We didn't evolve from animals killing and eating each other and the strongest surviving and all of that millions of years Darwin stuff. We were, we were created by God. Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. And there was no death in the Garden of Eden. So what was God appointing to them as their, as their daily fare? Well, it says in verse 29, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed, which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for, the King James says, for meat, just meaning for food there. So Adam named the animals. He didn't kill and eat them because there was no death in Eden, and that was a beautiful thing because in the new earth, we'll fast forward to the end right now, Isaiah 11 says that there will be peace again among man and animal, among the animals, and the lion and the lamb will lie down together. It's a beautiful picture of Eden restored. And it says in Revelation 21, there will be no more death. There will be no more carcasses, no human death, no animal death. You know, that's Satan's idea of beauty and goodness. Like he loves like, you know, vultures pecking at the eye of a precious baby fawn that, that, that was killed. And our hearts go out to all the death of not just people, but animals. 
You know, that's, a, that's something Satan thinks is beautiful, and it's his hobby and idea of a good time is death and, and just nastiness and darkness. Sorry about the graphic analogy, but the devil delights in that. He thinks that's beautiful. How, how twisted is that? Um, let's go to 318. This is one more thing God mentions here in this original diet. It says at the end of verse 18 of chapter 3, thou shalt eat the herb of the field. So God continues after the fall with a plant-based diet. Now go over to Genesis 5 verse 27. Have you heard of Methuselah? Methuselah wins the contest for healthiest guy ever. You know, he lived to 969 years, and that's what it says in, in verse 27 of chapter 5. Methuselah, his days were 969, and then he died. And so on that plant-based original Eden diet, these, these antediluvian people were living hundreds and hundreds of years, 969 years. And you know, God put his Israelite people on that same kind of diet in the wilderness. He gave them manna from heaven. He said, we're going to go back to that simple diet. We're going with plants there. And they lusted after the flesh pots of Egypt. They're like, no, we want our food that we got to eat in Egypt. And he said, all right, I'm going to send some quails in. And you're going to have so much of it, it's going to be coming out your nostrils. And I'm going to teach you a lesson here. And then while it was still in their mouths, the plague came upon the people. And God said, this is going to be loathsome to you. In 1 Kings 19, you remember an angel cooked a meal for Elijah, and he needed some, some strength. He was about to go on a long journey, and what did the angel cook for him? It was bread and water. It was a simple plant food meal again, and then he went in the strength of that food for 40 days. Interestingly, by the way, Psalm 78 refers to the manna as angel's food. Isn't that cool? The angel cooked that for Elijah. Angel's food. So, so plant food is definitely a theme in the Bible. It's called angel's food. It's the Eden food. It's the new earth food. And there will be a tree in the new earth that the, that the fruit is yielding a new fruit every month. God's miraculous power in creating beautiful and wonderful and tasty food for us. You had the, the Israelites preparing to go into Canaan eating that simple diet. We're preparing for the heavenly Canaan. There's some food for thought. But you're wondering, okay, there was, you know, there was eat, meat eating in the Bible. How did that come in? When did that come in? Why did that come in? Where did that come in? Well, let's go to Genesis 9. And in verse 3, God states, Now every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. This would be literal meat. Um, even as the green herb. Now I've given you this every living thing. Every moving thing that liveth is going to be your food. Well, does the Bible contradict here? Uh, because it seemed to indicate not eating the living things, but, well, it previously, this is the best diet for you. This is what, this is what the, the people lived on for that whole period of time before the flood. And now he says, now eat animals, please. What happened to set us up for that verse in chapter 9? Do you know Genesis 6 and 7 and 8? What was going on there right before this verse about go ahead and eat the, the animals now? Do you know what it was? It was the flood. The flood happened. And so Noah and his family come off of the ark. They look at this destroyed earth. How are those fruit trees looking at this point? How are those farming tracks looking at this point? The produce of the ground is going to be pretty scarce at this moment. And so this must feel really, really, really weird to Noah. Because for 1,600 years, the diet appointed by God had been plants and only plants. And God says to Noah, now I want you to kill these animals, slice them up, and start chewing their flesh. Like, what? That's a crazy thought, unheard of. But he's going to do it because this is what needs to be done at that time. Instead of his normal thing he was used to, grains, fruits, vegetables, nuts, legumes, seeds, etc. Now, was he to eat any and every type of animal out there? Go over to Genesis 7, verse 2. And God made a distinction way back here in Genesis 7, verse 2. It says, Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of the beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. So how many of each unclean animal was taken on to the ark? Only two. How many of each clean animal was taken on to the ark? Seven. So did Noah and his family eat any of the unclean ones? 
No, because he would have put them into extinction at that moment, right? You can't do that. God made a distinction between clean and unclean way back at that time. And you're going, I heard of unclean meat. Isn't that a Jewish thing? Isn't that kosher? Uh, this is going to feel very familiar from when we studied the Sabbath. And we were like, way back to Adam. Was Adam a Jew? This is way before the Jews. Noah, not a Jew. This is way before Abraham. And God is making the distinction between clean and unclean at that time in Noah's day. So what kind of things changed at the cross? Well, we studied the ceremonial laws. You know, those don't apply to Gentile Christians, to Christians in the New Testament times. The ceremonial laws with the animal sacrifices and the feast days and so on, obsolete. The national laws of the nation of Israel under the theocracy. Well, those don't apply in the place we live now. We don't live in that national Israel time. Circumcision, no longer necessary. There's a number of things in the New Testament that are not not applying to the Christian church. But here's many things changed. But did this change? Did what is healthy for human beings to eat change at the cross? Did our physiology change? No, no, it didn't. Uh, what was healthy for Peter before Jesus died on the cross is healthy for Peter after Jesus died on the cross. And why did I mention Peter? I want you to go to Acts 10 because Peter is a, a very good uh, analogy here because he says something about how he was eating after the cross. And this, this vision he was given has also given some people occasion to uh, find license to go ahead and eat whatever they want to eat. But the, the vision has been misinterpreted, misconstrued, and deception has come in on this point. Hence the title of this sermon, if you know where we're going, Arise, Kill, and Eat. But before we study that text in Acts 10, I have to give you some context. The Apostle Paul says in, Gentile, in, in Galatians 2, verse 12, that Peter was pulling away from the Gentiles. He, he, he was struggling with bigotry in his heart. As a Jewish Christian, he saw, saw the Gentile Christians as second-class citizens. And Paul says in Galatians 2 verse 12, I rebuked Peter to his face about this. And so Peter himself was struggling with his own issues there of bigotry against the Gentiles. And that's, by the way, an important lesson for us because Peter was leading Barnabas astray and division was happening in the church. Do you see division in our society today? Why? We don't need division over racial and ethnic lines. We are, we are so blessed with the Word of God and the truth of God that it says in Acts 17, verse 26, that God made of all, of all nationalities out of one blood. We are one human race, one blood. We All nationalities came from Adam, came from Noah. It also says we are all his offspring in Acts 17. We are all, in that sense, we are all children of God. And then even more, when we are in the brotherhood of the Christian family, we are adopted as, and have the, the heirs, we are heirs and have the privileges of sonship. And there is neither Jew nor Greek. We are all one in Christ. So biblically, my racial identity should not get anywhere close to the strength and importance of my identity as a Christian and my identity as a fellow human with every human. So now let's look at Acts 10 and see how God took Peter to task on this. Well, in verse 9, on the morrow, as they, were, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were, so what was in this sheet? All manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air, all sorts of the variety of animals coming down in a sheet. And Peter sees this, this, this group of animals, and he hears a voice that says, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter says, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. This is after the crucifixion. He's, I'm not eating unclean meats. And the voice spake unto him again the second time. And he says, what God has made clean, don't call common or unclean. And this was done three times. Now, if you just stop there and you don't read the rest of the chapter, you'll be like, well, apparently every, meat, every animal is now clean. Um, well, you got to keep on reading. Go to verse 28. This this parable, this vision, symbolizes something. And Peter learns his lesson 
because he knew his heart was wrong on this. He says unto them in verse 28, You know that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. And that's the Pharisee's law. That's, the, that's man's law. The Jews practice at that time. But he says, But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. He was convicted and he repented of his bigotry. Now, what did the verse say? Put it on the screen here. But God has shown me that I should not call any what? Any man <laughs> common or unclean. So we didn't have all of the animals proclaimed as clean there. So let's review. Adam and Eve, we got plant-based diet. The pre-flood people, plant food. 1,600 years later, after 1,600 years of that, you have the destroyed earth. You have the temporary addition of clean meat after the flood, and that stays as clean meat straight through the New Testament. In fact, all the way down into Revelation 18, verse 2, it references every unclean and hateful bird. So this, this distinction between clean and unclean is in Genesis uh, verse, uh, chapter 7 and all the way into Revelation 18. And it's never overruled there. And then in heaven, we are back to the Eden diet. So now, the moment of truth. Um, go to Leviticus 11, because this is where people are like, oh no, what qualifies as a clean and an unclean animal? I think I've heard, I think I've heard, uh, oh no, is, this, is God going to show me something from his word? It's a big change i got to make. This is hard, believe me, I know. This is not easy. But before we read Leviticus 11, which delineates what God told Noah is clean and unclean, um, if God said to you today, to surrender like the most cherished thing in your life. Just use a hypothetical. Would you be willing? So we always want to test our heart, and maybe this is the most cherished thing in your life. You're like, yep, that's the thing. But we always want to be in full surrender to God. So if he said to you today, I want you to do a 10-day pulse and water, vegetables and water trial like Daniel did, would you be willing? If God said to you today, I'm taking you all the way back to the Eden model of, of eating, we're going back to the Sabbath of Eden. We're going back and making sure we establish and, and, and preserve marriage as defined in Eden. We're going back to that. I'm taking you there and convicting your heart. Would you say yes to that if he convicted your heart on that? If he says, we're preparing for heaven. This is the heavenly day of atonement. This is the cleansing of the sanctuary. And I want to make sure that we are doing everything we can. Well, make sure we do the hypothetical before we look at the real. But here's the real. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, chapter 11, you might be like, well, Leviticus, that's all done away with. Now, remember, God told Noah there was a distinction between clean and unclean. Leviticus is just what defines that distinction that God gave to Noah before there were Jews around and kosher diet. So, Leviticus 11, verse 3, Whatsoever parteth the hoof and is cloven-footed and cheweth the cud among the beasts that ye shall eat, Nevertheless, these shall ye not eat of them that chew the cud or of them that divide the hoof, as the camel, because he cheweth the cud and divideth not the hoof. He is unclean to you. I'm sorry to break it to you. The all-you-can-eat camel buffet will have to be avoided by Christians heretofore who have heard the word of the Lord spoken. <laughs> the camel. Okay, we've got to start with the camel because the next one is hard for people. Verse 7. And the swine. Though he divide the hoof and be cloven-footed, yet he cheweth not the cud, he is unclean to you. The swine, the pig. You've heard that pork commonly has parasites, that hogs are scavengers, that they'll eat anything they can swallow, and it's gross and it's unclean. But cooking, you know, I'm going to cook it. Well, that's not a foolproof plan to destroy the parasites. One person in Arizona hit the news when a parasite, the doctor thought it was a brain tuber, turned out it was a parasite growing in her brain through the pork she had eaten. And it's a cancer risk, a major cancer risk. World Health Organization says bacon and ham and sausages are as big a cancer threat as smoking. Did you know that? We've got the Surgeon General's warning everywhere about smoking. Where is the warning about eating these pigs? It's as big of a cancer risk as smoking, according to the research. That's, and by the way, not to mention heart disease. That's a whole other can of uh, problems there. Uh, here's more in verse 9. 
of Leviticus 11. These shall ye eat of all that are in the waters, whatsoever hath fins and scales in the water, in the seas and in the rivers, them shall ye eat. And all that have not fins and scales in the seas and in the rivers, of all that move in the waters, of, of any living thing which is in the waters, they shall be an abomination unto you. So can you think of any thing that lands on people's plate after being dragged out of the water that is an abomination because it does not have fins and scales on it. Oh boy, this is people's favorite, right? We're talking about the crayfish, the shrimp, the shellfish, the catfish. All these things are bottom feeders. They clean up the mess. And there's a lot of mess. It's gross. For example, shellfish are filter feeders. An oyster can clean up to 50 gallons of water per day. And those toxins end up in somebody's mouth and stomach and body. That's it, I, a filter. I, I have a, a water filter where I pour the water in the top basin and then it drips down gravity style into the bottom. I've never had the thought that filter is an appetizing thing to eat. We don't want to eat filters. Not, not something we want to do. By the way, speaking of these unclean fish, I recently heard of this Rick Warren Daniel Plan book. And I was thrilled. I'm like, the Daniel Plan. That's awesome. The Daniel Plates. The Daniel Diet. Awesome. Seventh-day Adventists aren't the only ones talking about Daniel's diet. So I picked up the book and I expected to see Daniel's diet. Right? The whole food, plant-based diet with no alcohol. And I find this recommended meal plan. The coconut line shrimp skewers. Wait a minute, I'm not trying to pick on these guys. I'm sure they mean well, but that's not what Daniel would eat. That's nobody in the Bible ever ate those things, the faithful people of God. So we have to go with the Bible. If you've noticed, especially with diet trends, it's the most shifting sands of human opinion, pseudoscience-laden thing you will ever find out there. The thus saith the Lord is the absolute certainty. You get, oh, margarine is good, margarine is bad. And then it's the Mediterranean, like in the Atkins trend. And then it's keto and paleo and this and that. It's like, I'm just going with Daniel. I'm just going with the Eden and the new earth when in doubt. And with the Bible, there's no need to doubt. You don't need to wonder about the latest things that the bloggers are saying. So, oh, of course, Jesus did not, with the pig and with the shellfish, he did not proclaim those clean anywhere in the four Gospels. People say, Mark 7, 19. People have mistranslated and misread that. Jesus said, food that is eaten with unwashed hands. So it's the ceremony or the, the traditions of men, the, the ceremonies of the, of the Pharisees that they were imposing upon he people with their various hand washings. He says, that food is not unclean because you didn't do the hand washings that they tell you you're supposed to do. Now, I emphasize the word food there a couple of times because the definition of food had been laid down since Genesis 7, clean and unclean. That unclean meat is not food. Jesus never proclaimed that to be clean. And the Lord didn't tell Peter that pork is magically clean either in, in Acts chapter 10. So you might have heard those. You might have heard Romans 14 says, oh, if you're going back to eating vegetables, that means you have weak faith. <laughs> have you heard that one? <laughs> totally misunderstanding that. That's a text about Paul dealing with food sacrifice to idols. And he deals with that in detail in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And it's certain people had a sensitive conscience. The translation weak, it makes you think that you're not a strong Christian. People were feeling like they shouldn't eat food that was sold at the meat market that had previously been offered to idols because it's a pagan who had been preparing the meat. And they said, well, that meat is kind of contaminated. And I don't feel comfortable with my conscience eating that food because it had been sacrificed to idols. This had nothing to do with the kinds of food. It was the same kind of food, whether it had been offered to idols or whether you're going to avoid that kind that had been offered to idols. So Paul says some people might feel that conviction. And he says, if you feel free to eat things that had been sacrificed to idols, don't be a burden on the conscience of others and eat it in front of them and so on. So that was a little, a little thing they had to sort out in the early church. It had nothing to do with pork and shellfish and such. Something else to consider, by the way, we've seen these specifically delineated items in the Bible as being pro prohibitive for, for, for Christians, for everybody from Genesis to Revelation. But 
There are things today in our world that weren't there in the Bible times that we have to use our discernment and our wisdom and our prayer life and ask God, like maybe eating that, even though that didn't exist in the Bible times, isn't something I should do, like, you know, smoking cigarettes and, you know, that kind of thing, where we use our conscience as led by God. Um, so big, the big food industry, they are masters at manufacturing food in a way that just like triggers certain neurons and that one fires off and makes that one crave this food's made by the same brand name. I'm like, unbelievable stuff. I can't get into it all right now, but they have whole floors of like neuroscience experts on this in the big food companies who are making the flavorings and creating the processed food. Isn't it interesting that we call it the manufacturing of food? Like, didn't God manufacture it when it grew from the earth? We don't have to manufacture the food, but it's so highly processed. Think about the junk food diet, you know? Maybe that would be proclaimed unclean if this was brought to us today. And by the way, speaking of the clean meats themselves, they're very differently raised than in the Bible times. You know, you've got traditional animal husbandry versus the factory farming style of today. And the Bible says, A righteous man regardeth the life of his animal. In Proverbs 12, verse 10. And the animal cruelty and the unhealthy conditions of these animals. You've got traditional animal husbandry versus the factory farming of today and the hormones and the antibiotics and the very unhealthy conditions that, of these animals that people are eating. It's just not the same meat as it was in Jesus' day. The fish being full of mercury and all of that stuff. So God never approved of our modern big food industry thing that we've got going on. But enough on that. But I know people are going, oh, no more bacon. No more pepperoni pizza. This is hard. This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And I know we kind of laugh about it, but it is a hard thing we struggle against. Our appetite, our diet, what I've eaten for 60 years, you know, that's not something you just, uh, that's easy to face and confront. And people go, this is going to be miserable. That's correct, actually. I, I gave up a bunch of things years ago, and it was miserable for a few days. I was like, oh, headaches from the caffeine and like the refined food, so much refined food and sugar and stuff. And I was just like having migraines and feeling terrible. Like my body was detoxifying. So it is correct that it will be, Jesus said, you will weep and mourn. And while the world rejoices, everybody else having a party, doing what they want to do. You're going to go through that hard time. But he says, then your weeping will be turned to joy, right? at the end of it. So weeks and months and years that followed that decision I made to give up so much of this junk food and drink, it's been beyond a blessing. I can't tell you. I wouldn't give this up for anything. I mean, my students in class, they'd see the energy level all day, like, Mr. Ritzman, what are you drinking? Were you on caffeine? What are, how do you have the energy? It's just a simple whole food plant-based diet that I like and to enjoy. And you got the carbo complex carbohydrates and get a good night of sleep, exercise in the morning, drink the water. And it's like, man, not just that, but it's, it's the, the clarity of thought and the emotional balance that comes from living these ways. But here's, here's what I really like to impress upon people when we're struggling. God does not want to take anything away from us that is not for our best good. You know what I mean? The Bible says he will withhold from us no good thing. That's uh, Psalm 84, verse 11. No good thing will God withhold from those who walk uprightly. He opens his hand and satisfies the desire of every living thing. At his right hand are pleasures pleasures evermore. Now let that sink in, because we let the devil get the reputation of he's the master of pleasure, right? Living in the world, living the worldly way, doing what you want to do with media and eating and drinking and uh, immorality, that's the route to pleasure. The Christian life is one of sober self-denial and kind of an angry wince on your face all day. Well, it is self-denial, but that self-denial brings joy. Here's the, here's the study. My good friend Chad Cruiser shared this with me. I'm like blown away. This is awesome. For every additional serving of fruit and vegetables that you add to your diet, you get a measurable boost of happiness in the research studies. You Just add one serving of fruit and vegetable to your daily diet and you are happier than you were before. A second one, do two, even happier. Three, they measured it up to eight. Eight additional servings, because what are you doing? You're crowding out things that are making the mind sluggish, which increases unhappiness and even in extreme cases, downright depression. Nutri nutrition and these things actually improve our mental well-being and outlook. 
So we have less emotional disturbances, less irritability, less depression, and just more joy. That's our God. He is a God of pleasure. He's way better at Satan than, uh, way better than Satan at pleasure. Satan can give you a high for sure. But that's always followed by a crash, isn't it? And then you desensitize your pleasure centers and you need a greater dose of it to get the equal high. And then the crash happens and it's this downward spiral and it's addiction and all addictions lead to depression. So it's not just our stomach, by the way. Healthy living across the board improves brain function, improves joy. From our exercise to hydration to sunlight and fresh air and good sleep routines, getting to bed at an early hour and having good rest and, and trust and low stress. And Sabbath rest is a great part of that study. Show the benefits of that as well. So try something like Daniel did for 10 days on these lines. Trying it out gives you like something to compare it with. My dad is an optometrist. He's retired. And when he used to have people come to the office, they look through these lenses and test their vision. But first when they come in, they think they're seeing fine, right? Oh yeah, I'm good. I don't have glasses. I don't need glasses and I'll never need them. I'm okay. <laughs> well, let's get a, get a test. And then you read the top line. That's super clear. Wait. The second line, I'm supposed to be able to read that? What is that letter? I don't know. And then he goes, which one is clearer? One or two? Uh, two. Two or three? Two. What does this mean that two is clear? Two or four? Two is the clearest. And then he breaks it to you. Two is a set of lenses that actually improves your vision substantially. So when you test, then you prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And, and it's not something that we should fear because it will only make our lives better. What do we have to lose, right? So test and try something different because most people don't think, oh, I need to make a dramatic change in our lives because we get comfortable with the rut we're in and we're good with the way we are now. And like change is uncomfortable. Trials are hard and we like the easy road. But I'll tell you something, trying something different. Or maybe you are in a position where you're like, I know I'm totally addicted to something very harmful. And I'll tell you something, Jesus Christ comes to you with not just conviction that you need to say no to that. You say, I want blank completely out of my life now because I know it's not completing to God. I know it's hurting me. It's not helping me. It's hurting others. My physical, my spiritual life. I'm going to replace that with something much better. That's the finishing touch of this practice. We don't just give up. The, the, the practice of, a, of recovery from something is really not just, I'm not going to do something. It's what am I going to do instead? I'm going to fill my belly with the fruits and vegetables and the good stuff. If I'm addicted to smoking, I'm going to put a bottle of water to my mouth instead. You replace the, the, the addiction with something better. And he has grace for our struggles. It'll be a battle. He's patient to work with us in our struggles. He, he knows the temptations because he faced them. And he can give us that same victory. So he's asking for us to give him our hearts, our willingness. We might say, I can't do it. But are you willing to step forward in faith and put the bottle down and say no to that fast food place and that junk food indulgence and that biblically condemned food item? If we're willing to say no to that and say, Lord, what should I say yes to right now? Because I need an answer real quick. Because the thought of not having that is pretty overwhelming. But I'm willing and I'm going to step forward in faith. His word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. We don't see a floodlight out in the future. I'm making so many changes in this series. This is overwhelming. Where's the next turn? I don't know. But we only find the next turn when we take the step. And the light reveals the next element of the path. So the light is to our feet, the Bible says. So we give him our heart and our willingness. And we say, with man, this is impossible. It is. Aren't you glad the rest of the verse is there? With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. God, I don't have the willpower. I've failed again and again. He's right. He says, you're right. You don't have the willpower. But give me your will, and I will give you the power. The two combined. And I surrender all. I say, Lord Jesus, no matter what it is, Throughout this series, my, my practices of how I live my life, how I understand truth, how I live with the Sabbath in relation to that commandment. I say, Lord Jesus, I surrender all to you. My life is not my own. Oh, I love this wonderful statement that I grew up hearing. It was a statement from hundreds of years ago, beautiful Christian statement from Protestants who penned this down and 
emphasizes at the first point of their doctrine. And it was, what is my only hope in life and in death? It is that I am not my own, but I belong body and soul to Jesus Christ. Body and soul. I am not my own. This is a temple for the Holy Spirit. Lord, empty me of self. Give me victory over self that I might live for you and only for you. So where are you striving right now? Where is the Lord convicting your heart? Say yes to that indulgence, that habit being put away forever. And Jesus, this isn't, this isn't all I tried. And I, no, he's got a plan for you. And he'll walk with you in newness of life. And you pray and seek that plan. And you understand recovery from habits and study into that. And he will give you the victory. It's a promise. Thanks be to God who, what's the next word? Gives us the victory. We are overcomers seven times in the first three chapters of Revelation. Jesus will give you the victory as you use your will to exercise. Everything depends on the right action of the will. We don't stand uh, paralyzed. We step forward in that light, and he will give us the victory. I believe that is a promise. So this is the end of our series together. I'm sure... Some things have hit home, hit your heart and mind, as they have for me as I study and even as I speak them. And this is decision time. This really is decision time. That I'm going all the way with you, Jesus. All the way. Maybe baptism. Maybe you've never been baptized biblically by immersion. You know the word baptized means to be immersed. So I guess that was a little redundant what I just said. Have you been baptized by immersion? That's like saying, have you been baptized by baptism? Baptism is immersion. Maybe you've never followed the biblical plan for baptism. And it's a, it's a very nice, we, we perceive that as a, a very nice thing when the babies come forward and they do the sprinkling. But, you know, it's not baptism. And you come to the point where you study the Word of God and you go, wow, it says repent and be baptized. Maybe during this series there's been something God's spoken to your heart from His Word and you've repented of something. Maybe just in this session. You're, you're dealing with some serious issue. And I am repenting of that. You know what the word repent means? Teshuva is the Hebrew word. It literally means to turn. I was going this direction in my life. I am turning and I am going toward Jesus now. Repent and be baptized. Have you made decisions that have transformed our minds from a previous belief or practice? Something we were deceived on. You know, Jesus said, when I send you disciples into the world, I want you to teach all nations and then baptize. You notice the teaching comes first. Some have been baptized by immersion, but you come to learn new truths, new understandings of the character of God. You come to love Jesus more because of these truths, and you go, I want to seek re-baptism, to recommit my life to Jesus in light of this knowledge and understanding of his presence in my life that is so real now. It is be going deeper. Or maybe I went astray. Maybe I've walked away from the Lord. Rebaptism in Acts 19, for example, was appropriate to some who had learned new things and they were growing and they were baptized at that time. A second time, learning new truths, coming back after going astray. Jesus teaches this is appropriate for us to make a public commitment to say, I'm going to take my stand with the Lord and I'm going to do this whole biblical sacramental process and practice. So these essential Bible truths are not just for our informational curiosity. They're not just to give to, to satisfy our interest in things that are isolated from me. These must be truths that transform, not merely informational, but transformational in our lives. And I know you've made decisions also, most of you, before you came to the series, but maybe this is the first time you've really heard the gospel. Jesus Christ died for my sins. I want to give my life to him. Maybe this is the first time you've heard that salvation is forgiveness and cleansing and that the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary is happening now and I must surrender my life to him fully that he will save me and salvation means healing it means restoring the image of God in man transforming and renewing my, uh, my mind you have in your bulletins a decision card 
Those who are watching online, you can always find the amazing facts, contact information, deadlymyths.com, for example, and you can say, I want to make a decision and reach out to amazing facts on that. On the card, you see, by the way, if you don't have a card, put your hand in the air and the uh, deacons will come and give a card to you. As they come down, keep that up nice and high till you get it. Uh, realizing I am a sinner, I repent of my sins and accept Jesus as my personal Savior. You can say yes to that. I love Jesus and desire to follow his example of baptism by immersion. Jesus did the example, didn't he? We got some down here that need a card, guys, right in the third row. I want to be baptized is what that second card says. That's a life decision. That's a turning point in life. I've wandered away from Jesus. I choose to rededicate my life to him and be re-baptized. Or if you're just considering baptism, maybe this is the first meeting you've come to all week. You're like, this is profound stuff from God's word. I want to learn more. And you'd like to have someone come and visit you, share more Bible truth with you, give you some free resources some Bible studies, study the word of God with you. Maybe you have questions about the Bible. I am considering baptism. would like to have someone visit me. As we enjoy another song by our good friend Jonathan, I would ask you to pray and fill the card out as the Lord Jesus inspires you as you listen to this inspiring song. have a closing hymn in just a moment. While, the, while we sing the closing hymn, don't forget to put your name on the card. You can fold it or you can just pass it right down to the, to the aisle nearest you and the deacons will pick those up during the closing hymn. So put your name on it and send it off to the sides. Please stand, please stand and join me in 608, Faith is the Victory.
Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle here at night. Shall veil the going skies against the foe in veils below. Let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory, oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. On every hand the foe we find drawn up in dread array. Let tents of ease be left behind and onward to the fray. Salvation's helmet on each head with truth all girt about. The earth shall tremble neath our tread and echo with our shout. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him that overcomes the foe, while raiment shall be given, before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame, will vanquish all the hosts of night. Jesus conquering name. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. We'll vanquish all the hosts of night in Jesus conquering name. I was thinking about you know, the seven deadly myths. And you imagine this fork-tailed, you know, horned entity, this, 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 this very diabolically dangerous devil. He's just a created being. He is indeed deceptive and powerful in his fear, but in the name of Jesus, he is nothing. He is going to be crushed under our feet shortly in Romans chapter 16. Crushed under, God's going to crush him under our feet. Because we, in the, as soldiers in the army of God, vanquishing all the hosts of night, every deception, every addiction, everything of darkness and discouragement will be destroyed. And there shall be no more death, no more sorrow. Are you looking forward in hope to Jesus' soon coming? Amen. Have you made a commitment to Jesus today? Don't walk away without saying yes to what he has asked for you to do. We have to obey and walk with him as Enoch walked and we get the joy of being translated without seeing death, as Enoch did. I've been asked to remind you that the ushers will be at the, at the doors for those who are preparing to give tithes and offerings, and to also remind the ushers of the cards at the aisles if they have not come to pick those up. We want to get those housekeeping items done as well before we walk out. And what a delight it's been to be with you. Shall we close this with prayer? Father in heaven, we are so thankful and grateful for the power in the name of Jesus, for the power over self, over Satan, over sin. We thank you for the power of Jesus over, over deception, over discouragement, and over darkness of any kind. We love you, Jesus, and our lives are totally yours. We come to Calvary for a cleansing right now through the merits and righteousness of Jesus Christ alone. There's power in the blood. And we know there's power over, over our own habits and things that we have gotten into. I just pray that as we walk forward with these, with these promises from your word, that it will be with hope and with the presence of Jesus feeling ever nearer, nearer, ever nearer is Jesus our prayer with you. May this whole thing be all about you and everything heretofore and going forward. Be all about you. Our whole lives are yours, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray, amen.